on doing what? All right, just give some Good people, um, yeah, give the people a, bit, a couple of moments to come in there, Joe. It's nice yeah, to have you probably. back, Joe. You you were one of our <laughs> very, very early supporters back, I think it was, was it February, Joe, of 2019? Yeah, 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 that was cool. And then um, we had another nice, well, we actually met in the flesh, Joe, um, helped me substantially to make it to the AWE 2019 San Jose uh, conference, which was awesome when we met and we had, uh, we had a great time there. Hope to make it back there this year, Joe, by the way. Um, yeah, no, sure. yeah, we're going to give people a bit, a bit more time to arrive because I have a feeling sure. um, we're going to have a few more people visit. Uh, did you see the uh, Charlie Fink presentation just now, Joe? Uh, no, I missed it. It's, it's, it's 7 a.m. here. So, uh, ah, of course. The only, okay. well, the only thing we haven't solved yet in, in the metaverse time. <laughs> time zones. Absolutely. Time zones. Um, it's live stream, so it'll be on the YouTube channel. You can watch it back if you're interested because it was really, really hot. It was really, really yeah, hot. Yeah, no, Charlie's great. Charlie's awesome. All right. Well, I think, are we going to make a start? Okay, I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction and you can pick up from where I leave off. So this is Joe yeah. Millward, everyone, um, who has been instrumental on starting up uh, many successful uh, businesses and is also uh, working or leading the XR provision for TAFE. Is that safe to say, Joe? Um, yeah, TAFE New South TAFE Wales. Is, yeah, TAFE, thank you. TAFE New South Wales. And uh, he and his team are responsible for delivering XR content to check this out, half a million students, 500,000, I got that right, isn't it? 500,000 yeah, students, yeah, around that. can you imagine that? Um, I mean, I'm, talk, I'm getting excited about having 40 quests and that is exciting, but um, Joe here, he, uh, <laughs> it's like, it's almost a bit of, um, most of Wales you're trying to um, educate with XR there. So if anybody knows about big scale problems, scaling up and that, Joe's your man. Um, he's also a legend of a guy, super generous, super friendly. So I'm going to hand over to you, Joe. Take it away. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Cheers. Hi, everybody. Right. Um, so, yeah, as uh, uh, Daniel mentioned, um, we've got a, a, a pretty uh, challenging and exciting situation at TAFE New South Wales. Um, we're the largest uh, TAFE in Australia, uh, but there's a number of TAFE across the country. As uh, one of the guys here, Shannon from TAFE uh, South Australia, who's here. Um, and all of us are sort of exploring these spaces. So for us, it's, uh, it's really exciting to try and share what we learn. And um, we're in the process at the moment of uh, putting together our immersive production guidelines, which we'll be sharing um, uh, for everybody to, uh, to, to look at and see how we, we work. So yeah, just to reiterate on, on what Daniel started to talk about, um, we've got 136 campuses um, across TAFE. Um, as well as connected learning centres. There's about 10 connected learning centres. Um, so it's quite a large footprint that we have to think about. Um, and for that, there's obviously some really interesting challenges in regards to things like um, distance, um, handling lots of uh, headsets, um, getting access to content. Uh, so lots of uh, really challenging areas. And we're still in the early stages. We're working very closely with Oculus um, at the moment as they start to begin really looking at education um, as a viable option, but they're still in their very early days. So for us, we're sort of helping them and guiding them on, um, on that journey as well. Um, we have over uh, 25,000 industry connections. Um, so the TAFE uh, is a vocational training center. So we actually um, uh, work very closely with industry because the ultimate goal for our students is to get a job uh, in, in an industry. So it could be an apprentice, uh, in construction or uh, a baker, or uh, we could have someone being a hairdresser or um, even things like cybersecurity as well. Um, so it's a, a very broad range. We've got 1,200 courses um, that go from certificates all the way up to degrees. Um, and then we've got, um, yeah, 400,000 plus um, uh, commencing students every single year, and that uh, fluctuates based on the year. Um, but yeah, it's quite a large footprint, and, and at least um, a fifth of those are online only, um, which is another challenge as well. Uh, and then the other, the last one we've got is we've got 12,000 uh, teachers. Um, the average age of our teachers is 51. Uh, so that's a, you know, definitely older um, uh, 
demographic and, and for us to make sure that they feel comfortable in virtual reality or augmented reality, uh, it's really important that we build these tools in a really uh, friendly way that uh, has good onboarding um, scenarios, things like that. So, right. Um, so how we're using uh, VR at the moment, um, and most of this will be VR focused. Um, uh, we do do a little bit of VR, but uh, this is mainly VR focused. Um, so pretty much the big stuff we're identifying first uh, is things around process and uh, procedural um, uh, induction. So getting people to understand uh, a complex process. So um, we've got a plumbing experience, for example, where you have to understand how to cut um, a copper pipe, but check for electricity before you do that scenario. Um, we've got another one using an explosive power tool, so like a nail gun. Uh, so how do you properly handle that tool? Um, and then we've got something like childcare, where you have to clean the childcare centre um, before uh, children are going to um, come back into the centre for the day. So they're very step-by-step um, -step process driven uh, applications that we, so we started to focus on. Um, and then we start looking at more abstract stuff. Another big part of it is reinforced learning. So um, while students um, may have maybe half an hour on, in a practical scenario, uh, virtual reality allows them to then go back and practice that, that process. Um, over and over again, as, as many times as they like, and they can fail uh, safely, and also they can um, do it any any time. So they can, uh, you know, 24 hours a day um, potentially, uh, where they can jump in and say, you know, I've got an assessment coming up. I just want to reiterate that process that I, I I'm being assessed on. Um, so for us, that us, it's really important. Um, we don't ever see virtual reality replacing training. Um, we always see it as as a complementary tool um, that will allow um, teachers to. Uh, either induct someone before they're going into a scenario that may be potentially dangerous. So we've got a welding scenario that we've developed. Um, so allowing them to jump into that scenario um, and safely navigate their way around a welding device before they're physically touching that device. Um, so we, we use the principles that Stanford sort of um, identified, which is the dire stuff, which is that dangerous, impossible, rare, and expensive. Uh, dangerous is definitely an area where we've focused because it's probably you know, the low hanging fruit where we can say this is going to be safe as well as be impactful. Um, but definitely the other um, two that are probably most forgotten about, I mean, expensive is really important as well. So getting um, students and teachers access to expensive equipment is really um, important. Um, but the one, two in the middle, impossible and rare, um, are really interesting areas for us. So uh, one of the impossible scenarios that I've been challenged with is putting a, um, a, a student, um, a male student in the, fe uh, in the sh uh, shoes of a female student on a work site. So a lot of, um, a lot of uh, students don't appreciate if you're a female in a, in a male dominated um, uh, industry or v vice versa, allowing people to step into the shoes of somebody else and understand you know, what it feels like to be um, a, a minority or a, or a different gender in a particular industry that may be dominated by another gender. Um, and, and making them appreciate that. And that's something you can't really do outside of virtual reality. Um, and then rare is a big one for us as well. So we can um, cause a fire to break out in a childcare centre to click the button in, um, in virtual reality. Um, but that's not something you'd want to practice in, in the real world. So for us, allowing us to, to identify those scenarios and make them really impactful is really important. Um, we also have uh, sophisticated analytics um, behind our, our application, so we're able to see exactly where people look, what they do, um, and, um, and that's been really invaluable for us to ensure that we're building things that actually have an impact. So this is a snapshot. Um, uh, over the last five months, we've built um, seven VR applications. Um, and it's been quite a challenge. Um, uh, one of my uh, lead developers, Elliot's in the crowd, and he's, uh, he was one of the guys who had to jump into that challenge. Um, and so these are the areas that we focus. You can see here, they're quite diverse. Um, so we're not sort of looking at just one area. Um, the canine anatomy experience um, was really important. Um, it's, it's quite expensive uh, for students to get uh, access to um, uh, cadavers of, of dogs. And, and you, know, you don't want to have to do that if you, if you can do it in a way that's uh, as sophisticated. Um, and also the cadavers tend to be frozen, so they're actually not as accurate um, uh, anatomically. So being able to have a student jump into um, a, a, an environment where they can explore uh, the body of a, um, of a dog um, and understand um, 
exactly where organs sit in relation to each other uh, in a really effective way is important, um, but also seeing maybe how a muscle works um, inside the leg. Um, you can't do that with it, obviously, the cadaver, and it's, in, it's quite traumatic um, for a student to sort of see a, a live surgery uh, very early on, especially in their career. Um, a explosive power tool uh, application I mentioned, um, it's a very dangerous tool. Um, we uh, work very closely with our subject matter experts, uh, and that's been a really important thing we identified is ensuring the people that we work with really understand um, the process that they, they're doing, um, but also understanding um, how virtual reality works and what the impact of virtual reality is. So that's been a really uh, fun and uh, exciting uh, exploration is getting teachers who haven't touched this technology to, before to become experts. And that's what we want to try and achieve is the fact that they will actually be able to sort of identify scenarios um, that we can work with them and say, come to us with really challenging ideas. And, and the EPT guys in particular uh, did a great job of that. Uh, plumbing, as I mentioned, is, is cutting um, pipe um, in, a, in a plumbing scenario. Um, that was our first experience. Um, we actually uh, have done over 20 iterations of that experience um, just because we were trying to get it right. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about interaction design in a little bit. Um, but yeah, we, we want to make sure that the applications we build um, are bulletproof to the point of, uh, you know, someone who's never used virtual reality before can jump into a scenario um, and feel comfortable. Um, our science lab um, application was really interesting. Um, we have approximately a thousand animation and 3D students and game students across uh, our cohort. Um, so we were able to leverage those students um, and get them to work with us on this uh, science lab project. There was over 100 assets that needed to be created for the project and um, they were working cl closely with our lead artist who was giving them you know, real world deadlines. So the students were working on a real world project um, and then also understanding the challenges of delivering something for the Quest headset. So they obviously had to keep their poly counts low, everything had to be optimised. Um, so that was a really exciting project for the students to work on uh, and that, that application will be rolling out uh, shortly to our science students. Um, childcare is um, probably our most exciting application. Um, it's very early days with childcare at the moment. You um, go around the childcare centre and you identify um, dirty or broken toys and other hazards that you have to clean up before children are going to enter the classroom. Um, but for us, um, we see the opportunity is that um, we're, we're going to move towards fully AI-driven, um, realised children who will be able to interact with you. And, and, and that's, that's a huge opportunity for us. Uh, childcare is our largest online course. Um, so for us being able to give the ability for uh, students to get early access to children, um, majority of, uh, especially online students, don't actually get to interact with children until very late in, the, in, their, uh, in their course. So for us to give them the opportunity to maybe read a story to a group of children in virtual reality and have those children interact if their story is interesting or if it's boring, um, that's really exciting for us. And, and we see a huge uplift and potential in childcare. Also, childcare is probably an area where most, you know, development studios wouldn't see childcare as an area where they they want to invest um, so for us we're trying to make sure we can build an application that we can give to the industry as well um, so that they can um, you know license that from TAFE and use that inside their own childcare centres to uh, maybe induct uh, new workers or um, uh, help train in a particular scenario as I said we can have a fire breakout in the childcare centre or we can also have um, a child have an epileptic fit or have some other issue um, that can be replicated in virtual reality safely um, and, and you know still have the uh, complexity of understanding what process they need to do. Um, the other one um, we worked on which was really interesting is stage lighting. So looking at this stage here obviously this all has to be rigged up in the real world um, and that's a pretty challenging thing for students to do. A lot of times they've got to um, bring the rig down and, and, and physically rig up the lights, go up again and, and, and test it and then do it, bring it down again. So it's a quite a physical uh, process to actually understand how these lights work. Uh, all the lights are super expensive, so not all schools have access to all lights, which is a challenge. So what we're trying to do with stage lighting is allow a, uh, an impossible scenario 
where we have a mini version of the light rig um, that students can drop lights on and understand um, and see on stage how those lights interact with each other. Um, so it allows them a really quick way to um, get an understanding of the principles of lighting and also uh, how different lights work, um, some of the different parameters that they have, but also um, be able to experiment and explore. And that's an area that is a little bit challenging for teachers that are under, uh, uh, trying to work out a, a process driven um, uh, uh, scenario, allowing those those students to explore in, uh, in an area that they haven't had a chance to explore in before um, is really quite compelling for us. Uh, and the last one's welding, um, and welding is a pretty sophisticated application. Um, the team's been working uh, quite hard on uh, replicating uh, the welding um, uh, itself, but also uh, a big part of it is safety. So for us, it's it's having someone inspect the welding bay. Um, and actually ensure that all the uh, you know scraps of metal are cleaned up off the floor. The the welder itself uh, doesn't have any faults. Um, the extraction fans turned on at various other uh, processes. Um, we actually base that on a welding bay that's in the, the campus that I'm on at the moment, and it's so accurate. Our artists did such a great job. We put the students in that actually work in those welding bays, and they were just completely shocked because they couldn't believe how accurate, and it felt like they were back in that welding bay. And that's the level of detail we want to try and get, that students feel like that this is not a, a poor substitute, but it's actually um, uh, just as in, uh, invaluable um, as what they um, uh, do in the real world. So, all right, just bear with me a second. All right. Uh, okay, so uh, looking at um, de design and development um, uh, considerations. I know that that's probably breaking all the rules that Daniel talked to me about in regards to the size of the text, etc. Um, but if you can see that up, up the top, um, we sort of focused on a bunch of areas. This is work, we worked with a, um, a, a, a CX organisation who um, they basically uh, helped us identify which areas we should be focusing on when de we're developing content. Um, so one of the first ones we looked at was constraints. Um, so those are things like uh, user constraints, um, you know, uh, hardware constraints is a big one. So when we first started on this journey, everything was connected to a, a PC. So you're looking at a three and a half thousand dollar Australian PC plus a thousand dollar headset, you know, lighthouses, all these crazy setups. And that was a really big constraint for us to actually be able to roll this out on scale. Obviously what's happened uh, since then is things like the Oculus Quest, which I'm using at the moment. Um, so that's hugely reduced uh, the constraint of that hardware. Uh, and that's been really important for us to make sure um, that we're thinking about um, you know, the costs, um, but also the technical complexity of getting this stuff out into a classroom. Um, some teachers are obviously in, uh, scared of new technology and we wanna make sure that they feel comfortable um, with this technology, you know, if anyone's used the Quest, where I'm sure if you guys give me some emojis on who's on a Quest at the moment, um, the um, the the Quest is a really easy device to use, um, and it's like turning on an iPad. And that's that's for me uh, is the level of complexity we want a teacher to, to sort of have to look at. Um, so if we look at um, other areas. Um, Physical constraints is a really interesting one for us. Um, we have uh, about 11% of our students that, uh, uh, identify some form of disability. Um, so we want to make sure we're actually building applications that um, allow us to consider those students. So um, one of the things we're working on with our interaction design at the moment are adjustable tables in every scenario. We've got one of our learning designers in a wheelchair um, and we don't want to have the table right way up here and you know, at his chin height. Uh, if he's able to move that 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 table down to his height, uh, it means that he in, feels more included. And and you know, even if it's not available in the real world, that scenario, at least he's able to understand the principles. And isn't restricted by the fact that a table's in virtual reality uh, too high for him. And that's that's the beauty of this this environment is that we can adjust things and make it more customised for different people. We're also looking at uh, things for people that may have some form of vision impairment, which is a really interesting area. Um, so some people can see. Um, with different shades um, of colour. Um, so we're looking at those uh, that exploration as well this year. Um, we've also got an audio uh, specialist who's looking at spatialised audio uh, for, for uh, students that are actually completely blind as well. So um, there's some really interesting areas that we want to uh, look and explore in this space. Um, and we've also, we're working um, on, on language as well. Uh, all of our scenarios are driven by 
uh, a um, artificial intelligence um, a voice. Uh, so all of our voiceover, all of our voice interactions are driven by an AI. Uh, so it means we can change languages quite quickly. We can also change our accents and, and change the content itself quite easily as well. Um, so standing versus sitting, um, you know, I sort of covered that a little bit with the wheelchair stuff. Um, physical and emotional um, stuff as well is really important. I'll talk a little bit about that um, further on. Um, so looking at um, sort of scale and spaces, this is definitely sort of sitting in that area of um, uh, comfort levels, um, understanding things like, you know, uh, focal points, um, you know, uh, realism versus familiarity. So we're, we're always in a constant battle with my team. Um, we try and make sure we have no artificial UI in our experiences. Um, so we want to make sure, sure things are grounded, but sometimes you have to break that sort of realism barrier. Um, and definitely grounding we found is probably the most important thing. If people don't feel comfortable in virtual reality the first time they jump in, the worst thing you can possibly do um, is put someone in a roller coaster experience or, you know, uh, uh, the plank experience or something like that as their first VR experience because they'll never come back. Um, and that's something we really, really uh, try and ensure that people understand is we want to make sure people feel comfortable in these experiences before they start jumping into things that may challenge them. Um, so looking, you're talking about interactions and I'll, I'll, I'll di deep dive into one particular area on this, um, is standardization of tools. So we want to make sure that any student or teacher or anyone in the world that picks up a TAFE experience, um, they instantly understand how the, the, um, the tools work if they've done an experience before. So we want to make sure that uh, every interaction um, has a common, uh, I guess, uh, sort of profile. So you know which button to press to pick up an object, which button to teleport. So making sure that those are common across all our experiences is in, in incredibly invaluable for us. Um, and we want to, uh, we're, we're building, as I said, we're building immersive production guidelines in the not too distant future that we'll be sharing. Uh, so those will actually really highlight um, what we see is important. And some of those things are things like um, affordances are definitely an area we're, we're focused on. So that affordance, as I said, making sure things are grounded in the real world. We don't have floating UIs or um, you know crazy things happening in people's vision that doesn't happen in the real world. So that's really important because we were trying to we are trying to replicate real world scenarios. Um, so you want to make sure that people aren't feeling like this is a bit of a toy or a game. Um, Things like um, you know buttons and menus and other things we're, we're really paying attention to as well. So making sure that you know if they go out and press a physical button that it feels like a physical button that interacts that way. Uh, they aren't having to press it five or six times. Um, interaction versus reaction is really important too. So um, getting people to um, ask for more information as opposed to having information served on them is really invaluable. We've run, we've started to realise that if you put um, a voiceover on an application. Um, people are going to spend most of their time interacting with the stuff in front of them and not listening to what's going on. And so they'll miss the point of what they were trying to do or what they were supposed to do. Uh, and if there's no re replay uh, a mechanic, um, you tend to find that they don't really get, uh, do quite that well with that scenario. So for us, what we want to make sure is that people are able to ask for more help. We're sort of um, looking at a Hey Siri mechanic as well inside uh, the VR experiences so they can call up a personal assistant whenever they need to and say, hi, I'm lost or what do I do next or whatever it needs to be. So that's that's for us uh, definitely mechanics we're looking at to make sure that it's not just sort of um, uh, reacting to the environment or interacting, but it's a combination of both. So. Um, then looking at navigation, um, we try and reduce teleporting as much as possible, especially in some of these early scenarios, because it's a, a complex uh, concept um, and can be, um, you know, induce a little bit of nausea, especially for people that may be new to VR. Um, so we try and reduce that as much as possible. Sometimes it's unavoidable um, and we're looking at different mechanics on what, what works well with that. So um, teleport markers and things like that. Um, if we look at health and safety, um, definitely for me, eye strain's a big one, um, and, and, but also eye health. Um, so um, we, we spend a lot of time um, uh, in, in headsets. We're, we're spending probably uh, 30 to 40% of our time, the developers maybe even more of our time in virtual reality every single day, um, which is a long time to spend inside these headsets. They do get hot, they do get heavy, they do um, you know, uh, have uh, sweat and the other issues. So we've actually um, implemented 
uh, a clean box device, which is a UVC light device where we put the headsets um, into those devices every day to clean them. Uh, so it's using UVC light, um, and especially if we're sharing headsets, we want to make sure that those those uh, headsets are sterile. Um, I've had two eye infections working in virtual reality already, and I don't want any more. Um, but things about like um, you know uh, neck and back strain, trip hazards. So making sure the real world's safe when you are in virtual reality is really important. Um, we're about to roll out a, a pretty large project um, out to a lot of new users, and, and we're going to have some onboarding both outside of VR onboarding uh, instructions, but also stuff inside VR that we want to make sure we pay attention to. Um, and then the last one is the auditory, auditory and emotional, um, probably the most important and probably the most forgotten about. Um, you know, audio for us is is uh, what we think about first now. It was always sort of the last thing we did. We always put it at the end. Um, we've, we're lucky enough to have an audio engineer in our team. Um, he's also our lead technical guy. Uh, so he understands all the hardware and all, all, all the way all the speakers work inside the devices and such. So for us, uh, he's been really important to sort of make us understand the value of, of audio. Um, in our virtual reality, virtual reality uh, uh, welding experience, for example, when you put the welding device, uh, helmet on your head, it feels like you're claustrophobic and it's very tight to your face from an audio perspective. And that really translates to what it is like inside a virtual reality head, uh, inside welding headset, sorry. Um, so that that stuff is, you know, such a small thing that you wouldn't think about. But if you can build that in a way um, that is uh, quality audio, um, then it's it's really, it's you know, adds a huge amount of value to, to the experience. Um, and then the emotional side is really interesting. We have a hard rule of no one under 13 inside a headset. Um, it's just at the moment we, when we're happy to have people jump in for a minute or two, um, but we don't want to see prolonged use of, of, of young children at the moment. The, the challenge I have with it is at the moment, this is a new medium. We don't know what the impact is, and, and especially physically, if, if the headsets uh, don't have a, a narrow enough IPD, um, then you've got a, a potential of damaging um, young uh, developing eyes. Uh, the other side of that, though, is obviously the emotional um, uh, sort of uh, impact of the, these experiences, like you don't want to put a, a you know a young um, person into a, something that's going to scare them or you know negatively affect them because virtual reality um, is remembered as a true memory. I mean, I dream in VR, which is kind of scary. So I'm I'm in <laughs> dreaming in virtual reality, which is really weird, especially because I spend so much time in it. So I'll be thinking about applications that we're developed for or uh, other applications that I've jumped into. That's how powerful that is. Um, so for us, we want to sort of make sure that we're making these environments sort of safe and not sort of heavily impacting the emotional sort of impact of these people. I, I've seen some of these horror games and, um, you know, uh, uh, and, and first person shooters or, or you know, first person action games like the, the late, latest one, uh, Saints and Sinners that's come out, Walking Dead. I mean, it's a lot different pressing a button on an Xbox controller to stab somebody versus actually physically doing something like that. So I think that there's got to be someone uh, considering the psychological impact of actually, you know, stabbing someone or shooting someone with a physical device in your hand and doing the actions physically. So that's where I see that is a, a something that hasn't been really talked about in the industry. Uh, the challenge is obviously a lot of the industry comes from the games um, uh, have, it comes from the games background, so they just think, oh, it's just another game, it's no big deal. But I think this medium is so new that we're still in, in the early stages. And the worst thing we can possibly do is release all these violent uh, games just thinking it's not going to have an impact like, um, you know, 2D video games don't have an impact. And that's been sort of proven, but we haven't proven that in virtual reality. And I think that um, that's, uh, you know, something that we have to make sure we're responsible for. Um, TAFE is a government organisation, so we have a duty of care. Um, so we don't want to make sure, like we in plumbing, for example, you can die, so uh, or you can get electrocuted, um, but it fades to black. There's a you know an ambulance sound in the background, so it's not too bad. And we don't want to sort of have those sort of super realistic, violent sort of areas. Um, you know, for us. Um, uh, as I said, I mentioned the voice command input. Um, voice is something that's not used that much in, in virtual reality, which is quite crazy for me. It's like it's it's one of the you know sensors that is really easily available inside virtual reality. But we, I haven't seen very many applications that actually use a voice command mechanic. Um, so that's definitely an area that we're looking at. Um, and then yeah, lastly, that psychological loading thing is is, is really important to pay attention to. Um, just... All right. Okay, so focusing on interaction design. 
I mentioned the uh, consistent button mapping, which is really important for us. We want to make sure that people feel um, that they can pick up the device. Um, they know this is a TAFE experience. Yep, I know exactly how to do everything. Uh, that's really important. Another um, area that we were really interested in uh, is um, who here, someone give me some um, uh, emojis if you understand what tomato presence is. I know Elliot does. Um, so tomato presence is a term that was actually coined by the guys at Rec Room. Um, so Rec Room, um, uh, when they first started building things, uh, there was obviously a constraint on, on devices. They were one of the first virtual reality developers. So basically what, what they did is um, every time you picked up an object, your hand would vanish and the object would remain. So you'd still have the object in your hand, you could interact, but you wouldn't have a physical hand there. So you'd actually, um, you know, sort of have a if you're picking up a tomato in a kitchen, that's where it came from, um, you, would, you would only have the tomato. Um, so it's been great, um, you know, it's been an easy mechanic for people to use, and, and, and it translates well. So the majority of the time you find that um, that tomato presence mechanic works. And especially if you've got to look at the particular object quite closely or you've got to interact with it a bit more, uh, it can be valuable. Uh, what we're finding now, though, is for heightened realism, um, adding the hand back in, correctly gripping the object the way it would be gripped in the real world um, adds value as well. So we're in a, in a bit of a um, sort of uh, experimental phase at the moment where we'll be looking at um, are hands important in virtual reality? Um, we think they are. Um, we're going to sort of add that to our production guidelines um, as we share those experiments. Um, and this is where my team is lucky enough that um, while we do have production that we build for, so we build for students um, and, and courses, um, also about 30% uh, of our time is, is focused on experimentation. So um, looking at new um, things that are coming out in the industry, so new headsets, new technologies. Um, we're looking at advanced haptics this year is one of the areas we're, we're, we're focusing on quite closely. Um, so looking at if, if you can use things other than a standard controller uh, to interact with objects in the world, um, does that increase fidelity? Does that increase memory retention? Things like that. So they're the areas where we're lucky enough to have that remit of not only things thinking about today, but thinking about what virtual and augmented reality looks like in the next three to five years. Um, real world physics is really important for us. We do have times when we don't have real world physics, or we have things that are, you know, as I said, a little bit um, outside of, uh, of reality. Um, but we really try and make sure we pay attention to the real world. So um, if you're trying to replicate uh, a, a process that's going to be potentially dangerous, or potentially, you know, uh, something that, that is very important to get right in regards to processes. We're working at the moment on a, um, on a uh, medical device uh, uh, experience. Uh, you have to get that right. <laughs> if you don't get that right, things can happen that are quite, um, you know, in, uh, dangerous or, or, or quite um, serious. So for us, it's making sure that those things feel as realistic as possible, um, weighting everything in the real world first. Um, and then everything in the scene for a reason. You know, I, I, I love Darth, the Darth Vader VR application. I'm sure lots of folks have, uh, have tried that. Um, but what really upset me is um, I was in the spaceship and there was all these really interesting things on the shelf and I went out to grab some of them and I could, and then some of them I couldn't pick them up. And it was the most frustrating thing. Um, and they turned the coin in um, interaction disappointment. Um, so we want to make sure that if there's an object in the, in the space, it's there for a reason, um, but it's also able to be picked up and has those real world physics. So you can drop it and it'll break if it's glass or you can, so whatever that is, um, we want to make sure that uh, the object in the space um, is there um, and it has a story behind it, why it is there, but also uh, it interacts in the right way as well. So we want to try and avoid that interaction disappointment. Right. Um, um, Seems now really uh, honing their skills in the uh, process and, and production. Um, using the, the, uh, the talents of students has been awesome as well. Um, and, and they get to learn um, as they're doing stuff. But these are the clean boxes I mentioned. Uh, this is our personal protection uh, uh, application.
it's a welding application and yeah, it's probably one of our um, you know, shiny sticking ones for me. This is an early version of lighting and uh, this, this uh, show is in November so we'll have a new show coming out this month. Plumbing. You can see here we had to do a FaceTime call with our, our plumber in this scenario because no one would phone off to look their ear. This is one I haven't talked about actually. This is our survey. So we've actually built a survey tool um, inside virtual reality. So allowing people to actually um, answer questions in a fun gamified way. Um, so if they were happy with the experience, for example. Um, so that was a really you know, interesting thing. People didn't want to answer questions on an iPad after they'd been in virtual reality. Uh, so this allowed us a, a mechanic to, um, to uh, ask questions. Uh, this is a, a project we did in conjunction with the um, uh, university, which is a virtual chicken, uh, our childcare, an early version of childcare. Um, and this is um, actually a third party application yeah. called Tribe that um, our, our music students got to actually work with DJs um, in, over in the uh, US. And some of the student work as well, so they were just like, no caterpillars were harmed during the making of this experience. And this is Thank you for your attention. All right. So, uh, have you got any questions? Is there any? Laura, can we turn on questions? Everybody give it up for Joe. That is that is amazing. Thank you. Wow. That is an incredible ending. I'm just I'm stunned here. I'm taking pictures. This is awesome. Suck it in, <laughs> my friend. This is a beautiful thing. It's all for you. you. It's all for you. All right. Let's open up and see if we have any are you ready for some questions? Ah uh, yeah, that'd be great. All right. So, if you have a question, please, please, for the wonderful Joe Millward, please hit that Ask Question button. It's down at the lower right-hand corner, and we will call on you. So, first question, the Bill Maher. How can we help you? The Bill Maher, you have a question? All right. No question. Okay, so now we have Peter. Peter, how about you? There you go. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, indeed. Oh, okay, very good. No, this is a, a great presentation, and I can see a lot of uh, applications in the fire and rescue uh, field for first responders. And what I was wondering is, you know, if you have, an, if you have ideas or if somebody has ideas on how they can apply this how do, how do you get started? Are, are there partners that part, you know to partner with, or do I have to learn how to create everything on my own? Um, um, or can I just yeah, do the requirement? It's, it's a great question, and and it's it's uh, so our mercy production guidelines. Um, while they'll um, they'll uh, be you know looking at how you build things, um, we also want to make sure we uh, get people to understand how they uh, identify uh, what they're trying to build. Um, so there's definitely, uh, you know, some great third party studios that we work with. Um, majority of our content is actually developed in house by ourselves. Um, but we do have, um, a number of studios that we do work with, um, lucky enough, Augmented World Expo, which is the, uh, uh the event that Daniel mentioned earlier, uh, that has about 5,000 to 7,000 attendees every year. Um, and that, um, for me, you know, is amazing to sort of connect with the industry. Uh, but the, the big thing for me is, um, you know, looking at those, those uh, dangerous, impossible, rare and expensive, um, uh, you know, pillars um, to understand, is this going to work in virtual reality? Um, there's an amazing um, fire uh, uh, simulator called Flame, um, which is F-L-A-I-M, um, which was created out of the University of Beacon in Australia. And that device is actually um, uh, inside a, a Vive headset, um, but they've also got a connected um, a fire suit. Um, and so you actually feel the heat and, and it's got a, actually a, a advanced haptics 
uh, nozzle which uh, has haptic feedback. So when you're you know, using the, the fire hose, it actually gives you a bit of push and a bit of feedback. So they, they're one group I know that have worked in that area. Um, there's definitely um, a lot of people exploring that area, but if you've got a, a um, uh, uh, if you've got a, um, a scenario, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn um, uh, or, or, um, or connect with me here, and I can and help you sort of flesh that out and, and maybe give you some directions in that way. You know, as we're, we're a government organisation, we're always happy to, to help people. Okay, how do I do that? Will, will you have a, a link or something where we can reach you? Uh, yeah, well, Joe, if you just look for Joe Millward on LinkedIn. Um, uh, yeah, just keep me on LinkedIn and I'll, 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 I'll you get my details from there. Thank you. Hey, All right. great question. Thank you. All right. Now we have Catherine. Catherine, you're on. Oops. Catherine, do you have a question? Okay. Yes, there you I go. Have. Sorry. Yes. yes. On, on meeting. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you, first of all, for your presentation. I've seen okay. that one of your main use cases is child care. And yes. I really would like to understand what you see happening there, because I'm not really sure what's the situation. Like in the kindergarten, the kids sitting around, or are you sit thinking about scenarios where um, the kids are widely spread and then brought together via VR. So what's the idea? Behind? Yeah, there's definitely yeah lots of areas we're thinking about. So one of the one of the uh, things that are identified in childcare is is making sure you're able to um, uh, physically see a student, uh, see a, a child uh, in the two minute window they have. So they've actually got to make sure they're paying attention to every single ch uh, child, you know, in the playground or in the in the classroom. Uh, every two minutes, you have to see them. So that's one easy mechanic we can do is using gaze gaze mechanic to have children running around and and making sure that 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 childcare worker is able to see every single child and make sure that they're not hurt or they're not you know doing something that they shouldn't be doing. Um, so that that one we can measure and these are. Especially, um, uh, you know, the benefits of, of virtual reality is we can measure that. We can tell exactly if that person has looked at that child in the right-hand corner of the room, uh, inside that two-minute window. Um, and then the other areas we see. Uh, one of the first things I want to try and do is story time, which is um, uh, an important thing that they need to um, to do is sitting down and reading a story to the children. And we're going to be measuring. Um, how the story is read. Um, so actually, you know, understanding that the tones change and shift. Um, and if the, 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 the story, you know, it was boring or, you know, not exciting, the children will actually get up and walk away. <laughs> so it's a nice measure for them to understand that they actually have to be playful with the, with the children and, and they can't just read in their natural sort of adult voice. Um, another interesting area is, is dance. Um, which is important in, in early childhood. So um, actually sort of doing, um, and I know Stanford did this uh, very early where they did a, uh, a monkey see, monkey do type scenario where um, you have to move your body in a certain way and get children to replicate um, what you're doing. So they're, they're, they're using movement um, uh, as an important part of their learning and, and, and things like that. And then those, those more, uh, you know, um, impactful things that you can't replicate. So uh, having a child that may uh, come from an abusive background and, and being able to animate what that looks like. Um, so, um, you know, uh, students are able to identify that there's something wrong with this child and, and what, you know, either questions they ask or what signs should they be looking for um, to make sure that they can identify a, a child that may be in danger. Great, thank you. No all right great question uh you know it's just amazing where this is all going <laughs> and you're right at the cusp it's just beautiful all right at bit eight bit biolog right, you're on eight bit hi eight bit you're on thanks again right, for the presentation thanks everyone um, do, you, do you have I had a question, question if you had yeah. time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah sure Effort. Um, I work uh, at Duke Health for the safety office. Um, I also collaborate with the university uh, mm -hmm. with a small group trying to bring VR. Um, and the common frustration for us, and I've heard it also by other universities that have small groups trying to do the same, is that we don't have that ability to produce content. And um, if you don't have that, a group of programmers 
it, it's very difficult to to proceed, uh, you know, mm -hmm. on your own if, if you're lacking someone that knows Unity or or a similar technology. Um, sure. You guys have a group. Do you think you guys would be open to collaborations with other schools or making some of this content available? It, it's hard yeah, to push VR when, when you don't have the content. Yeah, no, that's that's an important thing. And I mean, for us, um, like we're early days at the moment, but we're definitely open to collaboration. So um, we have a relationship with Stanford. We have a relationship with a bunch of universities uh, across uh, Australia. Um, so uh, for us, we don't want to see people, you know, building the same things we are, um, you know, honestly new stuff. So if we've got applications that people are interested in, we're definitely looking at um, how we can um, you know, productize these applications and give them, um, you know, under license or others, uh, other ways, uh, get them, get, get access, uh, give access to other, other schools. Um, so for us, we're definitely looking at it as, as something we're, we're, we're pushing for. Um, it, at the moment, the applications are still, you know, in their infancy, they need a little bit of work to become full products. Um, but our goal is, is definitely to have that available um, to, to uh, schools uh, across the world. Um, so, um, and, 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 and also collaborating as well. So if there's interesting challenges or interesting scenarios uh, for us that we can use obviously in our school, but then working in a partner school as well, that, that's really exciting for us too. Now we have a, that's great. We have a question from Lucas. Yeah, hi, um, I'm here in the front row. Hey, how you doing? Um, thank you for your presentation about your amazing work. It's really nice to see it. Um, and what I wanted to ask you is, um, what are your thoughts on like social VR? Um, so um, when you put like people together in one VR room and you know, the, the learning is, is um, within the group dynamics. Yeah. Um, do you yeah, have no, some it's thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, this is this is a, a, the perfect example of, of social VR. Yeah, of course. Um, so it, it's interesting. We thought for us that um, multi-user um, training scenarios were going to be really, really important. Um, but to be honest, they, they are quite difficult to, um, you know, enforce a scenario that needs two people to actually collaborate. So um, what we realized is, is for us to be able to scale this quickly, um, you can't always get two people in VR. So most of our, our, our scenarios are single player, um, but we do have the ability to add a teacher to maybe observe um, or, or eventually have people collaborating in space. So definitely it's not something we, we um, we're sort of uh, not paying attention to. Um, as I said, we work really closely with Oculus, so we're obviously looking at what they're doing um, and, and wondering what horizon vault space for us is fantastic we're um we're going to um start doing a, a one stand up a week in in virtual reality um i've got two remote um uh, team members at the moment and we're going to increase those those team members um, but we also want to be able to invite any of our um, virtual reality champions you know, across the organization to jump into vr once a week to see the latest content that we're developing so obviously the beauty of this is you know you can bring in 3d objects and, and be able to showcase what you're building um, we also work um, collaboratively on prototyping um, so our team jumps into virtual reality together quite often um, to understand space. Um, so, you know, it, does this feel like it's the right size? Does this object feel, um, you know, that it's, um, uh, you know, the right thing? Because it's, it's crazy when you build things in virtual, uh, in, in 3D uh, and then move them into virtual reality, you can almost guarantee they have to be, um, uh, they have to be, you know, resized or, or adjusted. So getting our team together in virtual reality is really important. Um, and, you know, we also, you know, have Friday interaction uh, uh, um, time in the afternoons, which allows us to play new experiences together um, to understand how they work and the mechanics that work behind that. So yeah, I think it's, it's incredibly invaluable. I think the big thing is getting a group of people like this, like Daniel and, and the team um, uh, have done a fantastic job on, on getting, you know, the amount of people coming to these sessions uh, is incredible. And that's just showing, I mean, when I first started ah. you know, jumping into VR, uh, yeah, that's awesome. We're all fantastic too. So just getting, getting these people together is amazing. Um, and, you know, they just, cancelled Mobile World Congress because of um, obviously the coronavirus and, you know, we don't mm -hmm. need to travel, you know, we, we can be ah. here together. That's um, what part of the joy here. Really All right. So you have an invitation, just like everyone in the audience, 
to head out into the very back there's a teleporter that goes into our social space if you want to keep engaging that's up to you guys we have the next speakers getting all lined up but I'm, again one last big round of applause for Joe Millward who's just been rocking the house here you are I can't tell you you are you've changed you changed my the first time you presented for us you changed my life and so thank you for changing <laughs> thank the lives of everyone here it's just beautiful all right thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank so just head thank you head on out right out through the door and you'll see a teleporter on the other side of the stairs if you want to keep this conversation going a little bit longer and answer more questions we are going to be resetting the space here and getting ready for the next speaker so i'm going to give you a minute or so to get out before we throw you into the vortex and then bring you on back so head on out and thank you all uh coming up next if i could read the schedule is if i could read it i would be in great shape okay. <laughs> it's cool. It's cool. all right that's three times yeah yes Oops, I'm sorry, somebody was talking, I couldn't hear you. Okay. So Everybody next up we have question. Learning and Living in the Metaverse. Thank you. Project Athena. Social VR can allow Yay! us to be who we are and who we want to be. Do we want to do it in worlds greater than our own with others? In the Metaverse, we can challenge ourselves in such ways that will inspire growth in us as individuals, the likes of which we may never see otherwise. Yay! All right. So we have Kalia, I think I can't pronounce her name properly, <laughs> Explores Kalia. Learning and Living in the Metaverse. So join us for that coming up next. Awesome. Thank you. You got to the spreadsheet before I did. All right. I'm going to reset the space. So please, anyone who's in the middle of the movement, apologies. And you should come back if for some reason you don't. Just come on back to this event. All right. Four, three, two, one, go. All right. Sorry about yeah, that. So I thought we said. Oh, that, don't worry about it. Okay. Um, yeah, I reset you have our next speaker. Space, reloaded the program twice, and only once. Uh, hey, Jeremy. The came up. There she is. And how do we pronounce your name, by the oh, way? <laughs> Hello. Hello. Kalila. Got it. Okay. Kalila. Do you have your slides? I think so. Or, I have them. Um, I think you have them? Uh, okay. Shaz, in the back. Oh, Shaz, can you, yeah. you have the ability to paste them in there? Okay. Okay, uh, no problem. Okay. All right, beautiful. All right, Wait, Shaz, do you, you run this? Or, That's the best one. No, you should be able to see it. Yeah, it should create, it's, it's, it's never, this wasn't happening in the practice room. Um, I always use a great thing. Should I just wait a second? It may take a second to load. Okay. Especially if you have any <coughs> video or anything. Mm -mm. No, I'm seeing it just normal. fine on my end. Yeah, I'm seeing it too. I'm and too should I restart all space? Maybe. Kalia, oh, uh, look. Or re-enter. If you just hit the big circle, you know how to re-enter. I tried that because I wasn't seeing the previous presenter's slides either and it didn't fix it. So I just thought it was his slides, right? But I just lost audio. Well, now I'm not seeing this either. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and close down alt space and re-enter. That should fix it. That's what happens with Donna sometimes. No worries. Okay, she's coming back. So everybody is currently unmuted. We will be muting you during the presentation, but you can go ahead and mix and mingle until we're ready to start.
Chess, you want to take a sh shot at hosting? I mean, if, if you'd like me to host, I will. I'm actually in a call right now with Kalina, so. Perfect. All right, yeah, let's just do it. And I'll be back here to give you support. Thank <laughs> you. 